Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Open Floor. I'm Andrew Sharp, and on the other line, Ben Golliver. What's up, man? Not too much, Andrew. I'm going to pat ourselves on the back here. We've had a couple good podcasts in a row, and as a result, openfloormail at gmail.com is like the hottest club in the country right now. Everyone's trying to get in. Everybody wants to be a star. (laughs) They're dressing to the nines. We have emailers who I think are practicing for stand-up comedy careers emailing us. Uh, It's fantastic. The range of questions, the depth of questions is absolutely out of control. And I want to just kind of advise these people, guys, we really appreciate it. Don't forget, five stars on iTunes, you know what I mean? (laughs) Totally, totally. Every review is appreciated. We, If you throw a question in there, we'll read it on the show. We probably should do that. That would be good strategy to do that, but... So from now on, if you throw in a mailbag question in there, <laughs> we'll read it on the show. Um, but yeah, we had a bunch of great questions this week. We also have legitimate NBA news, which with Wade going to Cleveland, and it's just kind of crazy how much activity we've had to talk about. We're still a month away from basketball at this point, or at least three weeks, and uh I don't know. It feels like we're we're right back in the swing of things with everything. Um, yeah, so it's look, been if, fun. if if I'm going to call out KD for his 19 Twitter accounts and not taking responsibility and accountability, I should also probably call out all the NBA writers whining about how hard their life is because this is a 12 month sport and it's so difficult to manage. Guys, we <laughs> love this. Media Day opened up. It- Training camps here, preseasons around the corner. We've got like 72 stars in new markets. All these new teams are trying to become super teams like the Warriors. The Cavaliers have so much name recognition. It's kind of insane if you just list all the guys that are on their team at this point. Uh, I don't think anyone should be whining on Twitter, okay? Let's embrace it. Let's embrace the craziness and get into it. Yeah, I love it. I'm not whining. 11 months a year, the NBA is perfect. We do need a month off every now and then, but it's good. And uh, the So tonight, it's Wednesday night. We're recording this a little bit early, so if something crazy happens on Thursday, it may not be reflected when this publishes on Friday morning. But uh, for now, we've got D-Way to talk about. we got two questions here. The first one is from Brandon, who says, First time emailer, long time listener. How long will it be for Tyron Lou or how hard will it be for Tyron Lou to keep the egos of Derrick Rose and D- Dwayne Wade in check when they're both the odd man out with no three point shooting? Isaiah Thomas is presumably the starting point guard when healthy. What kind of impact can you get from Rose and Wade off the bench when neither can help you stretch the floor? And then the second question is related and made the same point and it was from Barack who's a, one of our greatest emailers of all time he says why is Dwayne Wade 74 in the top 100 imagine how much better the Cavs would be if they landed Eric Gordon 83 or Rodney Hood 87 instead of Dwayne Wade if LeBron is Batman then Wade isn't Robin he's Alfred yeah that's pretty cold Barack geez that's what I'm saying (laughs) these guys are trying to come out and be stars they're trying to launch their careers from our email account look my general way take uh with regard to the top 100 just briefly the vacuum (laughs) here we go (laughs) the the vacuum test is what put him where he was in the 70s because we thought hey if you get him in the right situation surrounded by talent maybe even put him into a sixth man role Uh, Don't make him try to do everything and don't play him alongside a guy like Rondo. He's going to look better than he did in Chicago last year. Yes, he slipped. Yes, the finishing's not there. Yes, the three-point shooting is definitely a question mark. The biggest issue with Dwayne Wade's game right now is his defensive awareness, uh, consistency of effort, and just desire to run back. I mean, those are the things that are going to potentially hold him back if and when uh, you know they're in the finals against Golden State. Uh, But still, this guy's a scorer. Uh, he can play make for others a little bit. He can handle. I mean, he's not who he was even two years ago. Uh, he's still a good player. The guys he mentioned in terms of Eric Gordon and Rodney Hood, they both sound better on paper than they've been so far. Hood's had injuries. Uh, Gordon really cooled off after a strong start last year. He's kind of a one-way guy. Hood's still got to show that he can do the all-around things necessary on offense uh, to be a lead dog. Uh, he should be able to get there. He's going to have an opportunity in Utah. Uh, but we don't want to rush these guys out the door necessarily when it comes to you know falling stars, guys like Wade and Dirk, uh, or even a guy like Carmelo Anthony. So that's the top 100 side. 
But I think the bigger <laughs> thing in terms of the fit with Rose, though, uh, uh-huh. a lot of the things that were concerns in Chicago absolutely apply to what's going to happen in Cleveland. When those guys play together, both of them are going to be lagging back on defense. Both of them are going to be trying to do too much at times on offense. Both of them are going to be you know, cramping your spacing uh, when they're well, out there. It's really think, tough to play them together. Yeah, and and to that point, I think that the solution is ultimately going to be Derrick Rose plays 10 minutes a game and and plays the role that Darren Williams played toward the end of last year where like he's he's on the team, but I don't know if he's really like in the mix, you know what I mean? And I think that's probably where the Cavs would be healthiest. Yeah, I think the the bigger issue is Wade because I think ultimately when it comes time to play the Warriors or to play in the Eastern Conference Finals, he shouldn't be a part of your starting unit. He should be coming off the bench. And I think that mm-hmm. will be a tricky thing to manage. So if we're talking ego questions, like Derek Rose, he's had some real issues with reality in the past. But I think he's going to understand on this team he's not a major cog, especially once Isaiah Thomas comes back. Right? I think he's going to be able to get that. Wade's been a full-time starter his whole career. He just made nearly $40 million in salary and buyout money to play 60 games uh, for Chicago. So, you know, one of, in, the, one of the great swindles in NBA history was to what Dwayne Wade just did to the Chicago Bulls. Yeah. In Gar, no that's, one trusts. <laughs> yeah. That's another title for Dwayne Wade's resume. It's unbelievable. But that is going to be an interesting transition. Does he understand that a guy like Jay Crowder can definitely help a lot more? than Dwayne Wade in a playoff series against Golden State. Is he how long will it take for him to get that? Will he push back I don't against know if it? Will there be friction? True. Yeah, I know. That's because you don't understand how team basketball works. We've been over this. <laughs> my God, I hate you. I cannot <laughs> believe we have another nine months of basketball to sit through together. Uh here's how I come down on Wade. I think you're right. I mean with with both Wade Rose to a lesser degree, although he's like pretty like fully washed at this point. But Wade, Mello it's tricky with those guys because to be on the level that they were on for so long, it takes like a supreme, almost pathological confidence in yourself. And that's that's what made Wade great is he never had any fear of failure. He believed he was going to succeed. And most of the times he was right. Same Same with Carmelo, although to a lesser degree. But the thing is, you can't just turn that off. And I think Wade is no different than Kobe in that respect. And that, like, most great players don't age gracefully because they just don't know how to sort of adjust and and learn to be that role player. I mean, Iverson's another example. Well, let Tracy me ask you McGrady this: Brady is a guy who couldn't do it. Like, well, let me ask you this though: If LeBron can extend guys like Richard Jefferson. And Kyle Korver, yes. once Isaiah comes back, wouldn't you agree with me that this is the ideal situation for Dwayne Wade? Because LeBron's basically a shooter. Isaiah's definitely a shooter. They're both playmakers. Isn't Wade just going to be feasting on very easy opportunities as sort yes. of an overqualified fourth guy? <clears throat> well, see, you didn't let me finish. Uh, the second half of my monologue here is basically that Wade... I, so I understand why people want to take shots at him. He is He's definitely lost a step, probably two steps. Uh, he was awful in Chicago last year. But I also don't think he's as bad as some of the hashtag smart basketball writers make him sound sometimes. Like I think he still has enough left to give you five or ten really good games in the regular season, and he can possibly swing a handful of playoff games which when you step back and look at it, like that was really all Kyrie did in Cleveland. Like he was, he was uh, a difference maker. On, in f- I, no, I'm, I'm dead he's serious. He's not going to be Kyrie, dude. Come on. I'm not, I'm not saying that he's going to be Kyrie, but Kyrie's value to Cleveland was a specific skill that became really useful in the playoffs, which is he could, he could jet, like manufacture offense in the half court in close games at the end of playoff games. Wade can do that too, and no, I think he, he people, can't do it on Kyrie's level. There's no way. I'm sorry. I'm not. Uh, I'm not. I, I saying, hear what you're saying, but he he can kind of do a very poor man's version of that still. But he's it's. I, I can't see that. Comparison. Right. Look, I'm not saying he's going to come out and and be 27 year old Kyrie and get and give them that same level level of production. 
But the idea that he can't help them at all because just because he doesn't shoot threes, like what Kyrie did well in the playoffs was not about shooting threes. Like he was able to just manufacture buckets when Cleveland needed them, uh, particularly against the Warriors. And I'm not convinced that that version of Wade is completely gone. Like he's still, even in, in Miami 18 months ago, he, he was coming up with huge playoff games. Like, this is what he's been doing his entire career, and I think that he's going to have some moments in Cleveland where he's not going to look as washed as people assume he is this week. I think he's being put in the best possible situation to succeed. I think that you're, yeah. def- you're definitely underrating Kyrie, the importance of Kyrie's three-point shooting because everything he's doing off the dribble is in part set up by his ability to pull up and hit from three and hit from three deep, right? And his presence just on the weak side of the court when LeBron's working one-on-one to keep his guy completely out of the way because you have to hug up on Kyrie is very yeah. valuable. You don't have to do that with Wade, and so that's where it gets tricky. That's true. The one comparison I would make is... Uh, let's not forget about how ugly it got in the 2014 finals when Wade was on the court. I mean, he really struggled and he was probably at a different place health wise <laughs> at that really point. Good point. But like if he couldn't keep up in 2014 against San Antonio in the finals, he has no shot in the 2018 finals to keep up with the Golden State team that's going to be better than they are. And this is really brings me, me to my point, And I think we can agree on this, which is this signing is better than the average internet person is giving it credit for and i'm not necessarily yes. taking the tack that you're saying which is uh maybe he's got more game left my tag no, is simple I, I just don't think he's i don't think he's completely useless for them and i think that he can yeah. if, if there's a version of this story where he plays 25 minutes a game and helps them a lot he may be coming to cleveland thinking that he's gonna play 35 minutes a game and that's gonna get complicated and awkward for everyone involved but like if he can play a role and be sort of a closer type guy who comes in as a specialist, he's not he's not completely useless. Okay, I would actually, I'm not going to argue with that. I actually, I pretty much agree with that. But I would even go further and say he might miss half the season. It's still a move worth making because your top priority as an organization is placating LeBron James and keeping him as happy as possible. Because well, yeah. this season can go off the rails so fast if the happy Le- LeBron we saw at Media Day, where he's giddy and yes, he was popping some very serious shots at President Trump, but he was also cracking jokes with the local media, telling them to basically bring it on, ask me any question you want. Uh, he said he was in a great mood. They need happy LeBron badly this season because the specter of his free agency is hanging over their entire season if he starts to do the poutiness that we saw when Dion Waiters was still there if he starts to disconnect like he did when David Blatt was still there if he starts screaming at Tristan Thompson proud new father Tristan Thompson uh, or (laughs) Banana Republic's finest Kevin Love if he's just screaming and pointing his finger at them at you know times this season Everyone's going to read that is LeBron's gone, LeBron's gone, LeBron's gone. And that could actually threaten what they do in the postseason to me. I mean, I think uh, yeah. the fact that he could potentially leave, is he's going to be under so much scrutiny that his mood and his uh, behavior uh, really matters. It's the biggest X, X factor for their entire season. The best way to keep him happy is bring in his best buddy. Even if his best buddy you know can't what? play that much anymore, this is the one situation where I'm actually kind of on board with like chemistry and friendships and all that would actually matter because uh, LeBron is going to have to do so much heavy lifting. I'm not sure people totally understand that. Uh, Kyrie had career highs in scoring and usage last year. That's just gone. Isaiah's not going to be there until January. That's months away. LeBron was yeah. already leading the league in minutes per game. He was third per in, well, that's, in touches that's per game thing. last year. That's I don't spiking. think much is changing. I, like, I, I, no, I don't it's think Kyrie was worse. helping. As like, Kyrie may have had a high usage, but he wasn't actually helping them win games. I think he may have swung five or ten regular season games last year, if that. I know. What I'm and saying LeBron is, though, was like, still doing everything. But you can't ask D. Rose to go out there and take the same number of shots and, and, and command the same <laughs> number true. of possessions as Kyrie. They don't have anybody else to do that. They actually do. His name's Isaiah, but he's not going to be there until at least January. And so that stretch from right now until whenever Isaiah gets back, and, and actually not even when he's back on the court, when he's back to 100%, is so critical for their entire season. Like if LeBron starts to get angsty, moody, whatever you want to call it, 
it's going to rub off on everybody. It's going to be felt throughout the locker room. So I love LeBron coming to training camp uh, and media day in a happy mood. I think that's the right tone. And I loved Kobe Altman saying, look, I'm throwing you this boat. Here's D Wade. Uh, hopefully he will keep you happy and, and hopefully he'll keep you happy enough that you want to come back and, and re-sign next summer. I mean, clearly that's the long-term goal, right? Is like just kind of hand over the franchise to LeBron and say it's yours. Uh, uh, we'll see if it works. But uh, yeah. that's that's why I like the Wade signing, more for the relationship with LeBron than for what's really going to happen on the court. Yeah, you know, that that is the best point I've heard on, on Wade because it is true and it's, it's one of those things, it would be easy to be cynical and say, no, that doesn't really make a difference. LeBron's probably leaving anyways. But like, it, this does help tip the scales to at least give the Cavs a better shot at stability and sanity this year, which is a win. Um, I also would add, I don't, I, like, I don't want to come off as pro-Cavs here. Because I still this this team sort of has like a 2004 Lakers vibe to it, and it could it's already kind of surreal and a little depressing. But uh, and I'm also not really pro Wade because, I mean, if if I had to go back <laughs> over the last like 15 years, I don't think I've loathed an athlete more than I loathed Dwayne Wade at the time. I don't want to use the word hate, but I really did not like Dwayne Wade at the peak of those Heat years. Um, but I, I have come to respect his ability to make haters look stupid. And he made me look stupid over and over again. And so I'm not ready to write him off totally just yet. Um, hey, you got to show, I mean, show some respect to three. And here's the one cynical counterpoint. Like if you're, <laughs> if you're really digging for cynical counterpoints, what you could say yeah. is this. Everybody was hoping that, you know, the Wade and Butler pairing their buddy-buddy relationship, the Marquette connection was going to uh, take Chicago to new heights and have great leadership in the locker room, right? Instead, yeah. you can make a pretty strong argument it went the other way, that they just kind of well, turned into their own little <laughs> clique, splinter the locker room, now Rondo's calling them out, the whole thing explodes, and poor friends and the just other standing thing is, there. I don't, I don't even think those guys were close. I think that was like a social media relationship that was never borne out in real life, and they would like post on each other's Instagrams no, and they're pretend homies. to be friends. They're I don't homies. know, man. <laughs> it's I, uh, that's not what I've like, heard. <laughs> Well, okay. I saw them working out. They seem like pretty good this summer, but uh, they're not on the same level as LeBron and D Wade, like banana yeah. boat lifers. And, and I think my point is that if it does go south for whatever reason, like if they all just decide, you know, look, D Rose really can't play. We're going to blame him. And, you know, for or however the, the Cleveland season goes sideways, do you worry that Wade and LeBron are sort of like, you know, off in the corner saying, hey, we're better than this. You know, we, this is what we signed up for. Like, could there be a little splintering there? I think that would be the cynical fear with this move. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying I believe that. I just think that would be the best counterpoint to everything I laid out earlier. Okay. Two final thoughts. One, this is all completely overblown because if you can sign Dwayne Wade for $2 million, of course you do it. There's absolutely no risk to the, to the Cavs, so screw it. Let's just see what see what happens. Also, it's going to be so weird to see him in a Cleveland uniform on opening night. Like that that element hasn't really sunk in yet and probably won't until they're playing together for the first month or two. Yeah, I was having this conversation with someone yesterday. It's not yesterday. really a, a take you can respond to. No, no, to, no. It, yeah. It's funny because I was having a very similar conversation because there has been so many stars moving teams this summer that I've actually become numb to that feeling. Like when I saw Carmelo in the OKC jersey, I would have expected myself to be like, whoa, mind blown. <laughs> and instead I was like, yeah, you know, just another star, change of teams. Yeah, like not it's really that really, big of a deal. I we're know, in a strange like, spot. Like and Jimmy for years, Butler in a Wolves uniform, I'm not used to that, used to that at all. I mean, remember Dwight in the Lakers jersey was like, oh my God, my head just exploded. You know, there was some other situations along the way, but now it's just, uh, I think the, the you know, our mental relationship, you know, connecting players to specific teams is just being completely fried by uh, whatever you want to call the modern NBA player movement. Yeah. Um, one more question before we move on. Answer in one sentence. Are, the, are this year's Cavs better than last year's Cavs? Uh, not until we know for sure Isaiah Thomas can be 
You know, I uh, on paper, yes. I used a semicolon. Yes. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, I I would have said on paper no, but I think that there's a psychological element to it where this year's roster gives them a better chance, um, particularly against Golden State. But really, just like running it back with that exact same group another year, I don't think that they would have lasted the entire season without wanting to kill each other. And uh, and then against the Warriors, I don't know how you talk yourself into having a chance after how badly. They were. I mean, there were a couple close games in those finals, but some of the regular season games were just blowouts. And I don't know how they would have been able to sort of psych themselves up for that matchup. Whereas now you got some different personalities in there. It could be a little interesting. They're still going to get their ass kicked, but they'll at least come into it with a little bit of confidence, which is fun. Yeah. One other thing that we should note, and this we've destroyed your one sentence maxim here, but. Uh, <laughs> These guys always load up during the season. That just happens. You know, they always add like three or four guys, buyouts, you know, trades or whatever. They've got that pick to potentially facilitate something. They've got a few contracts they could possibly package together to put into a deal. They don't have the world's like greatest cash of trade assets. Uh, but I don't think that opening night's roster is going to be what they go into the playoffs with. And I think there's a, a very good chance, you know, Shot guys hurt. always, yeah, guys always cut free. You know, these veterans always cut free and, uh, my guess is their rotation will look even better than it does right now uh, in April. That seems like a very safe assumption. Well, they will probably need it. So good luck to Kobe Altman. Um, let's move on to some media day tales uh, before we get to the rest of the questions. What was it like at Lakers day? So I woke up on media day and the first thing I saw when I awoke was a picture from the Pacers media day. And there was like four reporters standing around a table kind of like waiting to be let in. And that was it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, my first thought was like, okay, so this is probably why Paul George wanted out. Um, (laughs) I got to Lakers media day. There was a line of 60 people waiting for credentials basically to just even get into the media day thing. And I just bypassed the line. I was like, whatever. Like, let's just see if security kicks me out. They didn't. Whatever. I'm then ben I fa- Galver. The rules don't apply to me. Yeah, you know, big time. Just sneaking in, just <laughs> they, like it was a Mark. Probably just like it was a podcast. It's all good. Just, just like it was a Mark Furman book reading. Just you know, kind of <laughs> <laughs> totally. wormed my way in. But uh, so Rob Palinka was doing his uh, his you know State of the Union meeting, and it was in a fairly good sized room. And I kid you not, my entire body was pressed up against the side of a glass window as if I was like a bird that had just flown to my death because the room was so full. Like I was backed into a corner with basically no breathing room. I'm kind of claustrophobic. I mean, it was worse than an elevator in there, to be honest. And meanwhile, Polinka's hilarious. Have you heard of this uh, musical called Hamilton? (laughs) Like he was like, he was like acting as if Hamilton had just come out yesterday and explaining to everyone like, all about how the Lakers were young, scrappy, and hungry, just like Hamilton. And it was pretty surreal. He also compared the, the their young core to Taylor Swift when she first picked up a guitar or Kendrick Lamar when he first learned to rhyme. I mean, it was there was a lot going on in his, um, his address, but you know that's just kind of par for the course during media day. My real takeaway is their practice facility is absolutely insanely amazing. They flex so hard with the 10 trophies. I believe they have 10 trophies lined up above the uh-huh. court. That's just such a flex. I mean, you think about all these other teams out there, you know, just dying to get one or maybe they've got one and they just cling to it. You know, it's their whole franchise's, uh, you know, history and legacy all tied up into that one trophy. These guys just have 10. I mean, there might be an 11th, you know, <laughs> somewhere near the copy one. machine, yeah. you know, I mean, who it's even knows? Good. Uh, and then, yeah. you know, M- Magic's got his office up in one corner and he just wanders down. And, oh, look, it's Magic Johnson, one of the greatest point guards of all time. But to wrap this up, Lonzo is completely otherworldly in terms of fame. He had, I believe, two or three cameras just following him around from station to station at all times, probably with a total of, I'd say, 10 or 11 people managing the cameras and the cords, just basically capturing his every single move. Uh, he had to yeah. pose with basketballs in, in different like lighting uh, setups, you know, at least four times. Um, I think I saw- at any given time, Lonzo is being filmed for like three different bootleg documentaries. So that makes sense that he's trailed by camera crews at all times. 
I mean, he was getting asked if he had bodyguards. He goes, bodyguards? No, just one. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. Uh, yeah, no, it's just he's on such a different level in terms of the fame as a rookie than pretty much anyone I've ever seen in person. Um, yeah. And the contrast really just hit home when, you know, compared to those four media members in Indiana, there was probably <laughs> a good 85 listening to Lonzo talk about how he hadn't watched any Magic Johnson highlights in years. You know, like he wasn't even being compelling or saying anything controversial. He has no takes on the political climate with Trump. Uh, so you know, he's, it's honestly, I, I like that about Lonzo. I think if Lonzo were as big a character as the hype surrounding him, it would be kind of unbearable. But I like that when you actually talk to him, he doesn't, he's pretty mild mannered, doesn't have a lot to say. And is like his game is pretty expansive and a lot of fun, but I, I for now it's probably best to say less if you're Lonzo. I have a theory about this. Uh, so you know how long distance runners train at altitude, like uh-huh. they go up to like the mountains to practice for marathons because of the oxygen levels and you know getting their bodies conditioned so that when they come back down to like normal. Uh, altitudes they're like over equipped for what they're going to need i think that basically being lavar's son is like training at altitude i think that he hypes you so much and he's just like (laughs) so insane that once you get to lakers media day with a hundred people following you around everywhere asking you if you need anything and making you say these silly lines over and over again and and all of that it's like not even what a normal day was like in seventh grade. You know what I mean? (laughs) That's not even a theory. I think that's just a good observation. That's definitely true about life with LeVar. Um, And look, we're, we're not going to get into the Lakers now, but at some point I'm going to harangue you about not having Brandon Ingram in the top 100 and uh, ignoring the clear breakout year that is coming from him on media day. Although he's another guy who doesn't have much of a personality yet. But uh, he's going to be awesome this year. One of my other favorite things about Media Day is the team employees, when they ask the questions, it's clear mm-hmm. what stories that they're trying to kind of plant. And yeah, are they right planting to, Ingram hype? It's like, how far away is he from being an elite defender? What makes <laughs> Brandon Ingram have elite defensive potential? Like everywhere you go, you're hearing this question. I'm sitting there like, this guy's like 14 years old. I think it's going to be a few years before he's an elite defensive wing. I mean, those guys don't just like burst out overnight um but that's where they're going with ingram they see him as a two-way wing star there's no question about it i mean that is their hope for him um not going to happen this year but he should have a good sophomore year like you said you know he he showed some progress down the stretch um and well he's the perfect personality i say it'll factor into how they do recruiting wise you know like i think if he becomes a legitimate like two-way prospect that makes them a lot more attractive for other superstars to because he can help sort of extend their prime a little bit yeah i was just gonna say he has the perfect personality to be that second guy you know let lonzo deal with all the hype like he he if he kind of fits that pippen mold uh you know maybe game wise but you know maybe a little more offense than, than pippen potentially but uh, certainly personality wise, like he's, I don't think he's going to get jealous. I don't think he cares. I think he's just about hoop and they'll be interesting to be honest though. We're spending too much time on the Lakers because you went viral with JJ Redick in Philly. And I saw so many tweets and Instagrams coming out of the Sixers media day. And yet the only story that matter, Oh, apparently you fought Ben Simmons too. I don't know if it was a fist fighter or something like that. <laughs> Maybe you could tell us about that. But the story that mattered was that Joel Embiid is not cleared. Why is that not the number one story in the NBA right now? All right. First of all, you're such a weirdo with the tweets. <laughs> I didn't go viral. J.J. Redick went viral. But you take pride when you go viral, of when, when like an interview that you film goes viral. But I, yes, we did. I talked to J.J. about Trump, and he had some really great things to say. Uh, you can check it out on uh, my Twitter. I retweeted it. And, um, yeah, he's he's great. And... The Embiid thing, man, is really tough health-wise because, like, even walking around there, I I was in an area of Sixers Media Day where there weren't a ton of reporters. There were a bunch of them up by the press podium, um, but then I was down with sort of, like, the photographers for the day. 
And so I was able to sort of trail Embiid as he went through the fo- photo stations and was basically just goofing off for about 90 minutes. Um, and I talked to him for a while and uh, he's just such an infectious personality. Like everyone from the players to the staff to the people with the NBA who are there to shoot him, like everyone just kind of has more fun when he's around. And so seeing that and then also knowing that and and talking to every player and hearing that how excited they are for the season and then knowing how important his health is and how many red flags there already have been um in terms of like how available he's going to be it's tough man like it could it could be a little sad but i also think that um i believe him that he's going to try and play as much as possible this year because i think that this is this is a contract year it's a big season for him and so I think if he if it's possible for him to be out there, he'll find a way to get out there. Yeah, but like if you if I had asked you last <laughs> week, you would have assumed that he was going to play seventy games. Now you're saying he's going to try to get on the court. That is a huge story. I mean, these guys well, over under is practically five hundred <laughs> record. They're not even going to win twenty games without Embiid if he's not out there regularly. I mean, they're just too young. I like some of the moves they made. I don't have any problems with what they did this summer. But the whole thing is built around him. He's the franchise. Yeah. It, look, you're not. You don't have to convince me. It's it's they're in a, a strange spot right now, and uh, I'm, and I I'm didn't just, get into a. I'm just confused. Fight like with can Ben you, Simmons. Okay, we'll we'll get to Ben Simmons in one second. I'm just confused. <laughs> is it just because people like Embiid and they feel bad for him that it's not this huge story, or is it just because there's too much else going on with Wade, or is it a no. case of he's already been injured seven times, so we've already written the story? I mean, why isn't this like the A one headline? I think it's definitely because people like Embiid and because people want the Sixers to succeed. They like, like somehow the Sixers fans who have been like a, a terrorist nation on the internet have somehow endeared themselves to the rest of basketball fans. And now like everybody's kind of pulling for them to turn the corner here, even though there are some real reasons to be cautious in terms of our optimism this year. But uh, but yeah, I, I do think that ultimately it comes down to everyone likes Joel Embiid and wants him to succeed and doesn't. It, so like, I don't think anybody's going to sound any alarms until he's actually not playing. Yeah, well, my alarms went off. So tell me about this Ben Simmons thing, because <laughs> yeah. if anyone's listened to this podcast knows, you kind of have an axe to grind with Simmons. Like you've just been down on him for at least no. a year. And what? you would always ask me, who would you rather have, Simmons or Ingram? Simmons or Ingram? I noticed you already tried to plant the seeds earlier with some Ingram hype. I mean, no surprise <laughs> at all, knowing that you were about to talk about Simmons and probably rip his game to shreds. We know he can't shoot, okay? We understand that. But what happened with him i mean there was some sort of an altercation did you get kicked out by security was, did i hear that right <laughs> there was no <laughs> altercation okay. All, i was doing a bunch of interviews with various sixers players and when i talked to simmons we just had a little bit of a disagreement about point about whether he's really a point guard i think we w- we went back and forth a little bit and uh you know he was like i don't know how many ways i have to say it i'm the starting point guard and all I'm saying is it's a little bit more complicated than that. And he did not want to hear that. <laughs> but, like, you talk to TJ McConnell, and he's like, yeah, it's going to be a battle with those guys. Like, we're, we're going to be battling every day, and we'll make each other better, and it'll be fun. But, yeah, like, I, I, I think I'm a point guard as well. And you talk to Markel Fultz, Dude, and he's please like— please don't just say that you think TJ McConnell is going to beat out Ben Simmons for the point guard position. I'm in not the Sixers. saying that he's going to beat okay. out anyone. I'm just saying that there's not, not everybody is on the same page. TJ is like, it's a battle. Markel yeah. Fultz is like, we're positionless. We're all going to trade off and it's going to be a lot of fun. Ben Simmons is like, I'm the starting point guard. So it's It's a situation to, to keep an eye on is all I will say. Um, uh, and, I agree with you, but I think I've said before, he's going to be the starting point guard. What I'm, my dream scenario, honestly, is mm-hmm. for you to pick one of these fights with one of these players and for them to just say, look, you need to listen to your podcast co-host because he tells you the answer to these questions <laughs> all the time. I need Ben Simmons to go. Ben Golliver told you on last week's episode that I'm going to be the point guard. Why are you asking me this? That's what I need. That's what I want from this world. 
You know what? We ultimately, we bonded from there by talking about how crazy Sixers fans are online. And we were oh, just so like, you just, yeah. <laughs> you just threw like, Spike and Mike under the bus? <laughs> no, no, you, in a good way. But it was, oh, okay. uh, it was pretty funny. So we have a question from Jaden who says, is it good that these superstars are moving around and teaming up? Not, it doesn't really matter where they end up, but it's going to be a four to six team league for a very long time. Uh, so what do you think? And mainly I'm, I included this because it's an opportunity for you to do a victory lap after your stranded superstars magazine piece a year ago. That one held up very well, by the way, because <laughs> the guys who were involved, I mean, they, they moved in a lot of cases and other guys who were kind of fitting a similar profile also moved. Ultimately, I think this is really bad for the NBA. Uh, and the main reason why is I think that this movement is going to allow, say, eight teams to just alternate who's going to play host to the, the team up parties. Right. And we can kind of yeah. see the teams this year, Oklahoma City or Houston's in the mix. Uh, you know, in the future, we could potentially see what the Lakers or the Spurs or a few other really strong franchises, you know, the Heat might get another crack at it. Uh, you know, these teams are going to be in the mix. There are so many teams around the league who have no shot at hosting a superstar team up. Like, let's imagine that you and I are all stars. How many teams can we name that we would just never play for under any circumstances? I mean, there is a lot. And we know the reasons why. Poor ownership, uh, weird locations, small markets, uh, you know, whatever you might you know put out there as reasons why all stars don't want to play places. Uh, it just makes it that much harder for those uh, organizations to compete because they're just trying to get one guy on a rookie deal who they can lock in and build a nice team around. Meanwhile, you've got these you know other teams that are you know, hosting these very smart mm-hmm. and intelligent, uh, intelligently constructed superstar cores. Uh, I don't know. It really seems like this trend is going to further the divide between the haves and the have-nots. And it's going to also reduce the have-nots ability to be ever become haves. Like I think we're going to see a lot of the, the Orlandos and the Phoenixes of the world just get stuck being terrible uh, for longer than they should uh, under you know more regular competitive balance scenario. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I don't really have a take. I, I agree with most of what you said. I think we're just kind of in wait and see mode in terms of where this is going to go um, and. Yeah, it's it's too early to say whether this is like a one or two year blip or this is just how things are going to be. And I think it's probably healthier for the league if this is a one or two year blip. Um, but we'll see. I do want to say, and to for anyone who missed it last year, because not everybody has been listening to this pod for a year and a half, um, Ben wrote a magazine article about stars around the league who were stranded and needed help to have any hope of competing with various super teams. And one of them was Boogie. Wall was one of them, interestingly enough. And uh, Bradley Beal kind of turned into his sidekick. Um, But you're right that, like, everybody, I mean, Chris Paul, everybody's been joining up. Um, And so Paul George was one. Davis was one. Yeah. And, yeah, I mean – these guys realized, and actually I wrote an article about this uh, that's running overseas, but I think it's one of the things we can actually trace back to the decision because part of the decision was like, don't put loyalty and and the expectation that you're going to be patient on this crazy pedestal where you can never do what's in your own best interest, right? And I think yeah. superstars got that message from LeBron loud and clear, and they put organizations in positions where uh, they either had to you know force a trade or, or uh, you know, they potentially, you know, threaten to leave in free agency. So I think that's really what's driving a lot of this. I think it's a post-decision thing. I think it's going to be here for the foreseeable future unless they change the rules. Um, and I don't think they have any real plans to do that. I mean, I think that everybody needs to kind of get used to this new reality. And I don't know what you tell the GM of a terrible organization about how to keep up here or to be relevant or to have any shot at a title. Uh, I don't think there's an answer. You know, if you're going to have the, the potential to just throw together three, you know, star level players, and all you have to do is trade out guys like, you know, Canner uh, and whatever else o- Oklahoma City gave up, Sabonis. I mean, to get star level guys, uh, it's just not really a level playing field. 
Um, but I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily. You know, I just feel bad for the people who are getting left behind. I mean, I think it's going to be very entertaining to cover for us because the yeah. bigger high wattage combinations that we have, uh, the more success that they might have competing and the more teams we have that could potentially threaten Golden State. Uh, so it's good from at the top end. It's just tough for everybody else. Uh, I think Jaden was asking too about sort of legacy. Like, what does this mean for guys if they team up and they, and they get rings? Does that change, you know, how we remember them? Let's see some of them do it first. I mean, yeah, all it's the moves that we situation. saw this summer, you know, did any of, did anybody get closer to knocking Golden State off seriously? I'm not sure they did. Yeah. I also like that you just casually mentioned that you wrote a feature for the overseas edition of Sports Illustrated, which is actually almost cooler than writing for the for the domestic SI. No, no, um, no, 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 no. This is even worse because this is a German magazine called Socrates. So if you want to really make fun of me... <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, man. Tell me after the pod, you have to tell me how to order that. Um, I'm in. Uh, I do have one other question, though. Who, since you're the the creator of this theory, which I guess is not that unique of an insight, but... It was a who, unique insight when I first started <laughs> floating it. it. took guys like you about sure. a year or a year and a half to sort of pick up on what I was trying to say. I remember the first time I put it out on the podcast, your eyes glazed over. I could hear. I mean, you just wanted to talk about bucket getters. I was, you didn't want to talk I was about too, collective bargaining agreements. I was too miserable agreements. about John Wall at that point to really think coherently, but I did appreciate it at, at the time. Who's the new stranded superstar this year? Uh, there's two obvious ones and one that I want to float out there. Um, Giannis, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually I'm going to say Kawhi. I mean, he's not really stranded, but we're going to need to figure out how he gets his running mate. I think that's going to be the next big storyline, especially for next summer is going to be driven by who can San Antonio get. We should be talking more about this. Kawhi is about to go win the MVP and has no help. And I don't see a clear path to him getting help. Agree. Well, I think LeBron's he, going there next summer. So, you know, I, I think the whole banana boat. <laughs> no, sure. I, I'm like halfway serious about that. I do think LeBron should go to San Antonio. I'm putting that out there 100%. But um, the third guy I want to mention is actually Anthony Davis. And he's not the typical stranded superstar from last year because he has another all star on his team in Cousins. I'm just skeptical that that can work long term. Like, I'm not sure you can build around those two guys. I'm skeptical of it in the short term, too. Like, I don't think they have enough to be a playoff team this year. But longer term, like, if those are your top two you know, best players, is that going to be a team that's ever competing, like, for a top four seed in the West? I don't see it. So, to me, he's still that guy where he's a top 10 talent and doesn't have the right help. And so, for that reason, I'm keeping him in this conversation. Okay, cool. I'm just glad. I, the, the main reason I asked that was that so that we could uh... – seed some Ka- Kawhi uh, conspiracy theories for the so day because he's a free agent soon. I mean, why why shouldn't LeBron go there? I mean, who no, nailed Media Day? No. <laughs> Look, two people crushed Media Day, LeBron and Pop, right? In terms of like making the statements that are going to have lasting impact on like the political discourse. Ben, Put uh, them look, together. The Spurs, the Spurs LeBron thing was a funny bit in July. <laughs> but I need, bit. You to, I need you to understand that if LeBron and Kawhi were together on a daily basis, they would drive each other insane. LeBron no, they wouldn't. <laughs> put, put LeBron on the national team for three weeks with Greg Popovich, and it'll go great. They'll have great conversations. They, there's a lot of mutual respect there. But Pop, if he had to deal with LeBron's daily bullshit, would lose his mind. I think that, you know, much like you've really matured a lot, you know, you're 30 plus sharp. I think like post pop LeBron could be a completely different person. I think maybe pops got a lot to offer in terms of structure, you know, different kinds of discipline, uh, the intelligence factor. I think these guys be speaking, they'd be speaking on a different level than everybody else. And I, who knows what Pop could unlock from LeBron's game that we haven't even seen yet? I mean, LeBron's worked with some great minds, uh, you know, Spolstra. Uh, I don't know where you want to put Blatt in this conversation, but Pop would clearly be the best coach he's ever played for. There's no doubt I about think, that. I think that LeBron is doing great. His tweet has bought him immunity from any criticism from me for the next six months at the at at the least uh i mean and he was great on media day i can't believe he talked for 41 minutes straight like uh my friend juliette Littman was like yeah it was riveting he was he was fantastic i can't imagine watching any player talk for 41 minutes straight 
But yeah, he, like LeBron is is not going to the Spurs. I think we should okay, all just, just admit that now. <laughs> answer me this one question. Outside of Golden State, what organization offers LeBron the best chance to win a title in 2019? Because every year matters for LeBron. Yes. So hitting the ground running, not this season, but next season, where is his best chance to win a title? I'm going to say Antonio. Cleveland. Cleveland. Oh, come on. You got Popovich and Kawhi versus you're going to have to re-sign Isaiah. No, you still got right. this Kevin right. Love thing. Look, Thank you. You're right. It's San you're Antonio. Right that- you're right that San Antonio makes the most sense in a basketball context, but I think that LeBron is our, always operating with a couple different scenarios in play, and he's sort of, I mean, even even Cleveland, it was about basketball, but it was also about a, lo- a broader narrative and branding, and and I think that is why LA has a better shot than someone someplace like San Antonio. Fair enough, but like you said, best and most logical destination in a basketball context. Guys like me, LeBron, Pop, Ben Simmons, we understand the basketball context is most important. <laughs> <Totally>. <laughs> and eventually you'll, right. come around to, you'll come around to the good side. Well, you mentioned LeBron spending some time around great minds. And uh, you know what time it is. What time is it? It's time to step into the coffee shop. <laughs> oh. <laughs> We've got Wizard of Waz. He, he asks... If Kyrie's flat earth musings are coffee shop Kyrie, what the hell do you call Beasley's musings? Uh, we should play those on here for anyone who didn't hear it. Did you see this? Of course. Uh, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> you can research the human brain and nah, 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 right? Okay. It says that the hint, like we are only capable of using 10% of our brain, right? Yes. You believe that? No, it's, yeah, that's, yeah. Is you about to say it's true? I'm saying that's what people oh. say. That that is that so, is the consensus. So it's the consensus scientifically. So who was the guy that used the leaven that made it okay to say everybody is just using ten? That isn't the right logic. No, 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 no. Ten percent of just, your brain just, is the one that said ten percent. No, because if you're only using ten percent of your brain, you don't even know that you're using ten percent of your brain. Like, like, he knew it was 10% of your brain he? based on your brain. Who you don't have he? to be using 11% to know someone else. He's saying, I'm 10%, you're 10 like, everyone's 10%. That is that, not that, mathematically that, no, correct. That is not, like, like, someone had to. But you have to have been using 10, more than 10% of your brain yes. to know that everyone else uses 10%. Yes. <laughs> you know what? For the record, Michael Beasley does not need a nickname. He just stepped into the coffee shop, you know, to throw out some questions. He doesn't have answers. He's just asking questions. No, so he's got the Green Bees dispensary right across the street from the coffee shop, Kyrie. Uh, the Very Much Woke Cafe is right next to the Green Bees dispensary. You can just get, you know, one-stop shop. You see that a lot in Portland, you know, the coffee shop next to the dispensary. Uh, it's becoming more of a thing down here in uh, Los Angeles as well. I mean, go into business together. It's a natural pairing. You know, that, well, first of all, that Beasley interview reminds me of, uh, did you ever see the movie with Scarlett Johansson about, or Scarlett Johansson about um, the your brain, <laughs> your brain power? <laughs> you're going to have to do a little better than that to get <laughs> yeah, me to figure out what you're talking I don't rem- about. Dude. Look, I don't Look, remember. Th- I- <laughs> you know what just happened here? No, this is what happened. You listened to a Michael Beasley clip and 5% of your brain just died because he's that <laughs> yeah, ridiculous. So, so now you're just so. like it's- Johansson, Scarlet, like you're throwing her out <laughs> like she's some sort of like Icelandic figure skater. Meanwhile, ta- you're giving me like two word description of a movie that I definitely haven't seen. You know, I don't do anything with pop culture. How am I going to have seen some movie or be able to recall any movie that you're talking about it's unreal i'm really sorry i'm really sorry it's late the podcast is going off the rails uh <laughs> all i know is i saw i saw this scarlett johansson movie in la with my girlfriend like five years ago and i remember being really excited and then it was just like the, the weirdest movie i had ever seen my my girlfriend was kind of weirded out and uh and it was all about brain capacity. I forget the name of it. Great story. This is great radio. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yes, yeah, so that's basically what happened as I was watching that Beasley clip. As I was like, wait, where is this going? What is he? What is he saying? I do enjoy that he was just blatantly hitting on Taylor Rooks, the uh, reporter there. Um, 
which is probably a good segue into Kyrie here because he had some takes this week. This is from Boston Radio. I think it was about two days ago, maybe from Media Day, but here we go. All I want to do is to be able to have that open conversation. And when I say open, I mean open, look. There's no open. No, but look, look, here it is. Here it is. Listen to me. Listen to me. All right. Look, so what it did was it was all it was all an exploitation tactic. All it did was all it did was it literally spent the world, your guys' world, spent your, spent the world. It spent the world into a frenzy and it proved exactly what I thought it would do in terms of how all this works. And it created a division or literally like stand up there and let all these people throw tomatoes at me or like have somebody think that I'm somehow this different intellectual person because I think that or because I believe that the world is flat and you think the world is around. They created exactly that. It did exactly that to where it became like because I think different does that ever knock my intellectual capacity or the fact that I can think different things than you can. Mm-hmm. So we are your exactly art. You're, we are your experiments. Absolutely. Right. That was the intent behind it. Like, do your own research. Like, don't don't come to me and ask me, like, well, do you, I was just like, bro, I don't. <laughs> At the end of the day, you're going to you're gonna feel and believe what you want to feel, but I don't knock my life over like, here. I'm like, yeah. Kyrie, we're used to this strange stuff. Kyrie is so perfectly on brand right now. It's out of control. I don't even really know what to say. Well, he tried to float that theory out before and everybody shot it down. But just to kind of summarize it in a little bit clearer language, Kyrie wanted to prove that if he said something idiotic, everyone would call it idiotic and judge him for saying something idiotic. And that's what he proved. Amazing social experiment. Great exploitation, Kyrie. (laughs) Fantastic. Really well done. It was an exploitation tactic. Yeah, look, Kyrie is operating on a frequency that only the truly woke among us can hear. Um, and I'm into it. You know, I hope this continues all year. We're going we're gonna to keep coming back to the coffee shop because this is just the best. You heard about Beasley wearing the uh, wristwatch on his ankle, right? Yeah, look, it, Beasley, Beasley's been in <laughs> in his own zone for about 10 years now. And I'm happy, I'm happy for him that he's been able to extend his career as long as, he's, as long as he has. And the other thing that I was thinking about today, it, after your little spiel about how poor Zingas is going to love it in, in New York this year, which is <laughs> one, one of your worst takes of the last 12 months. Uh, Get out of here. He, Michael Beasley and Tim Hardaway Jr. are going to take 20 shots a game each, and Porzingis is going to be like, get me the hell out of here by Christmas. Well, Beasley is one of the best tanking weapons in the league. I mean, that it's That's true. <laughs> a, a great move. If you're trying to lose games and, and win ping pong balls, put Beasley on the court. But back when I worked at CBS and I was doing a lot of like aggregation or, or instant news type posts, I actually had a file of all of Beasley's like run-ins with authority, whether it was coaches, organizations, arrests. Wait, why? Because he would get in trouble so often that I needed to like quickly reference like his full track record (laughs) of issues. So I just had a file on my computer and it was like, here's links to every single thing that he's done. So I could fill out the bottom of my post with like, Michael Beasley was arrested for the fourth time in 12 days. Here's why he was arrested. And then like link up all the other ones. And you know what? Being a little little hyperbolic, but he, he didn't just accidentally stumble into that brain conversation is all I'm going to say. I think that he was building to that for quite a while. Yeah. I, I had a similar file. It wasn't a file, but I definitely remember at one point going back and copy, copying and pasting a paragraph of, Zach Randolph's transgressions <laughs> from an yeah. old post I'd written to a new arrest post uh, in like 2010. But Zach Zebo is another one who like turned it around, and it was he got a happy ending at least until this summer. It's a little little drama, but um, but uh, yeah. Shout out to shout out to Beasley. Shout out to Kyrie. Um, just asking questions, you know. That's what it's about. Um, to move on here to the podium at the end of the pod. Uh, you asked me to include this. This is a a complaint that we got from Corey. He says, hey, guys, I try to listen to the podcast, but as a Pelicans fan, you guys just make me upset. 
You keep saying it'd be smart for the Pelicans to trade Anthony Davis, but literally it doesn't make any sense to do that. I agree that the front office has been awful, but that's because the owner is basically a vegetable and Saints GM Mickey Loomis is basically in charge of both teams. Side notes, (laughs) Mickey Loomis has also kind of wrecked the Saints over the last five years um, and shouldn't be in charge of either team. Uh, but he continues to say, it doesn't mean they should give up on the team. I'm calling that. I'm calling it now. Boogie Brow will work, and they will re-sign Cousins. I don't like that you guys are basically begging for the Pelicans to trade Anthony Davis to the Celtics just because you prefer the Celtics. Let me assure you, Corey, I do not prefer the Celtics. I do not want Anthony Davis to create a super team in Boston that I then have to deal with as a Wizards fan for the next five to ten years. But, Ben, the floor is yours. I don't want to make any assumptions about Corey, like his age or anything, but he just <laughs> sounds to me like someone who's never had his heart broken, you know? And from that standpoint, I understand why he's mad at us because we're, like, laying this out here as a possibility that he could get his heart broken. But uh, his summary of the situation explains exactly why we have to have this conversation because basically what he's doing is he's standing on railroad tracks. He's saying, I hear uh, a train whistle in the distance. I see a light approaching. Oh my God, that's definitely a train, but I'm not <laughs> going to get hit by it. That's that's sort of what he's saying. I mean, literally read his own email. He's saying ownership is a vegetable. That's not a very nice thing to say, but ownership is definitely an issue there. The front office is horrible. Yeah, that's definitely an issue here. And he's saying the fit will work. We have questions about the fit between their stars, right? How many Mm -hmm. other factors are there that could drive a player out of a city (laughs) than what he's already just acknowledging our issues? I mean, come on, Corey. Like, you got to see that this could possibly happen. And I mentioned this uh, article I I wrote earlier about some of the stars moving. For the German magazine? Yeah, some of the guys forcing trades. But listen to this list because in the immediate aftermath, of the decision, a lot of guys change teams in trades kind of in similar situations, right? Carmelo Anthony basically hijacks his way to the Knicks. Chris Paul hijacks his way out of New Orleans. Uh, Mm -hmm. Darren Williams uh, basically scares the Jazz into trading him. Dwight Howard, uh, after a long, sordid mess, gets himself sent to the Lakers. Kevin Love goes from Minnesota uh, to Cleveland. Uh, under the threat of he wouldn't resign. Uh, you've also got Cousins in a mess in Sacramento, winds up getting traded, and then Oklahoma City, more for financial reasons, but also because they couldn't kind of come to terms with Harden and, and agree on his role and so forth. You know, They go ahead and trade James Harden. That is an awful lot of talent going from small market teams or teams that uh, weren't really okay. in good right. shape you've for one reason point. or another to another. So... We we have to talk about the possibility of Davis becoming a trade asset, given that history. We It would be derelict of duty if we were just sitting here saying, oh, no, Anthony no, Davis no. is going to be completely happy <laughs> with the Pelicans for the entire rest of the history of the universe. That would be so dumb. And we're not rooting for him to go to the Celtics. Uh, we're just saying, look, the clock is ticking on Davis. That's all we're saying. It's really funny that, you, that that was your... Uh, angle there because as you were talking I was thinking I can't keep talking about Anthony Davis to the Celtics or Anthony Davis trade scenarios we've made the case at listeners of the podcasts readers of our articles people realize where this is going I don't think we need to keep rehashing it every two weeks so I personally while Ben says it's our journalistic responsibility to keep talking about this, I don't care anymore, and I would like to just talk about Boogie and Brow trying to make it work with Rondo somehow and try to make, <laughs> yeah, get Drew right. Holiday in the mix. It's a really weird team. Uh, so I, not to uh, not to appease Corey, but to appease my own <laughs> boredom with this topic, and and in probably everyone who's heard us rehash it over and over again. No more Anthony Davis to the Celtics talk until at least February. And uh, we'll just talk about how screwed the, the Pelicans are on the court, which is uh, you're out also going to be fun. 
you're out there on the train tracks holding hands with Corey. It's gonna no. be wonderful. <laughs> I can't really wait not. until really can't not. wait till Conductor Rondo flattens you. Unbelievable. Yes. All right. Couple more questions um, to us. Uh, Will says, "Random inside baseball question for you guys: What does your average day at work look like? Do you guys go to an office or a home station, or is most of your time spent on the road at gyms and stadiums?" What percentage of your work is research versus writing time? Uh, does the podcast drive people to, to your writing or vice versa? So I'm curious about your answers to all of these questions. So I'll let you start. Well, you've seen my my humble Playa del Golliver. I mean, you know, it's not too complicated. I've got my home office. I don't go to an office. I just basically stumble out of bed over towards my desk. I brew up some coffee I uh, make a fresh batch of Benegrino bubble water. Um, what and time What time are you waking up in the morning? So it depends. During the season, I will watch games, and usually I could potentially write like until, say, 2 a.m. So in that case, I'm not getting up until like you know maybe 9 or 9.30. Um, mm. During the off-season when it's quieter, uh, you know, I'm trying to usually be up and, and going by around 8 or so. Uh, so you, part you of wake up and go birding in the off-season? Well, the off season is different. We could talk about that. But uh, in terms of like work habits, you know, I'm trying to get up at eight. So because everybody's on the East Coast, I'm out here on the West Coast. So I don't want to be that far behind. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But, you know, most of my travels around the playoffs, summer league, um, during the regular season, I don't travel that much. In terms of going to games, I try to go to, say, 30 or so, maybe 35 or 40 games a year between the Clippers, Lakers, and then whatever other stories might come up along the way. Um, otherwise I work from home. The, the main thing, the key to my day though, is I try to work out or walk, you know, exercise for at least an hour every day. And then during that time, I kind of get into my Zen master mode, um, where, you know, I'm thinking, I'm trying to like have deep thoughts about basketball. I'm trying to like, you know, look for angles that maybe I haven't thought about. I'm trying to come up uh, with new ways to make fun of you. Honestly, that's become more and more of my, you know, deep thought (laughs) hour. It's just like new ways to to rip on you during the podcast. Um, You know, occasionally it will drive me into kind of a rabbit hole like it did with um, the Kevin Durant rant last week. Right. Uh, (laughs) But I try to have about an hour of just sort of like clear headedness. I'd say I probably listen to at least three hours of podcasts on different topics a day. Um, I oh try my to God, read. Really? Yeah, I probably try to read for at least two to three hours. I mean, I I don't have like it's pretty obvious here. The social life that's not really a thing. Um, <laughs> and then during NBA season, I will start watching games at four o'clock, and I will watch until the last game's done. And I try to okay. do that as as many nights a week as I can. Um, that's my day. Good. <laughs> Good summary there. I love the enlightenment hour that you take. Um, yeah, that's pro- that is definitely where all your weirdest theories come from. Uh, my answer, but I don't really have a set routine. I probably should, um, and it's kind of chaos between trying to write and do this podcast uh, during the week, and like have to tweet and try to keep up with stuff, and then also I'm bad at planning for writing features like a week or two in advance and so balancing the reporting and uh and column writing is is a little tricky sometimes particularly this week um today i i spent about four hours trying to write those little capsules for each team in the nba preview issue and um Ben, as you can probably attest, writing like a 200-word summary of every team is actually a lot harder than it sounds because you have to fit a lot of things in. And so I basically drove myself crazy. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it changes. For me, it changes a lot week to week, except that I will say exercise and getting away from Twitter has been really important and has really improved my life over the last like year and a half. Um, which the coincidentally thing, is when we started talking. So okay, that uh, makes a lot of sense. I'm glad I could. <laughs> yeah, totally. I'm glad I could influence you. This is great. Tell me more about this, how I've made your life better. This podcast is all about personal growth for me. After spending time <laughs> with you, um, the one other story from it, it's sort of work related is after Sixers media day. So Sixers, I got out of there at like two thirty five, and then I had to do a radio interview at two forty. And then got on the road 
Um, and I had, and it takes about two and a half hours to get back to DC from Camden, New Jersey, where their their facility is. And so then I immediately jumped in the car. I had an appointment at five thirty that I had to be back for. And then I hit the road, and media day had been happening all over the league. So I was trying to like catch up as I was driving. And I wound up catching up on Thunder Media Day at a red light, <clears throat> except that it turned all the way green, and then I sat through the entire green light. Oh, no. <laughs> and it, it no, turned no. red again. It turned red again. And there was a cop behind me who then stirred, turns his lights on and is all pissed off and is like, what is wrong with you? What could you possibly be doing? And... I immediately copped to being on my phone when he he didn't realize that I was on my phone. So that was stupid. But then I was like, listen, officer, I'm just an idiot. I'm completely disorganized. My bad. And he let me go. So Sixers media day, that's ultimately what made it a win is that that cop at the end of the day was just like, yeah, whatever. You're you're a fool. Just stay off your phone. That's what makes it a loss. You should not be doing that. You should have been held accountable for your actions. You should have had to pay a ticket. That's (laughs) unbelievable. That should, right, have been a night, well, that should have been a night in jail, honestly. <laughs> Speaking of accountability, we have two more questions here. Matt says, have either of you ever had a piece turn out more wrong than Lee Jenkins' famous, famous cover, This Is Going To Be Fun, for the Lakers? Um, what's your worst in these terms? Well, you were there when, when I was in New York, and everybody was making fun of me for my trade grades on the uh, Nets Celtics blockbuster um, needless to say, <laughs> yes. I, I was a little optimistic or more optimistic than most uh, for the net side of that deal. Uh, I've argued with uh, Kevin Pelton about this in terms of like grading trades. He is so strict about only looking at the assets, like not even considering like previous moves or other factors. So like when the Magic traded for Ibaka and then traded away Ibaka, you know, six months later, when he was grading that second trade, he doesn't even consider the first trade or any of the context about the team at all when he's grading the second one. I generally take a more holistic approach. So things like being in a big market, trying to sell tickets, uh, you know, hype, sure. uh, trying to become a destination for other free agents in the future, all of those things to me factored into why I kind of liked it for Brooklyn more than most people. Um, but obviously it went completely wrong. And when you're doing those trade grades, you're you're always kind of thinking like, hey, what's the worst case scenario of this one? And there was never in my mind a conception that the worst case scenario (laughs) would become as bad as it's become for Brooklyn. Like it didn't even cross my mind. So that's on me. I, I didn't fully think through how awful trading all those picks and the pick pick swaps could become, even if, you know, Boston didn't ascend like they did, it still would have been horrible for Brooklyn. Um, and you know, some of that is because Darren Williams fell off a cliff. Some of that is because the other guys, you know, aged out of, uh, what was their prime at the time. I mean, there was a lot of factors driving this. Um, but ultimately, uh, that was a, a pretty big whiff. Also early on in my Blazers writing career, I was a big believer in Jared Bayless. Like I thought starting point guard material franchise point guard for the Blazers, you know, he's great fit with Brandon Roy. And this is what I was telling myself. Um, that one, you know, also did not work out very well. I also thought Dwight Howard on the Lakers would work a heck of a lot better than it did. I did too. I really Uh, did. And I thought it was part of the reason why, uh, I mean, obviously betting on Dwight was really stupid, but I also was betting on Kobe to mold himself and to kind of change who he was. And that was probably the stupidest thing that you, you could think of in hindsight. <laughs> yeah. Look, based we on all the last... got that wrong. That wrong. It's, it's based fine. on not only the last five years of Kobe's career, but really all of Kobe's career, thinking that he would adjust in any way was a pretty big and obvious uh, misconclusion. So those are some of mine. How about you? Um, well, first of all, to follow up on a couple things, I think Lee's SI cover and that SI, like everyone involved in that SI Lakers cover, it was so wrong that it should be a point of pride for all of them. Like I I would, I would be honored to have been a part of that cover. Um, because that's something you can laugh about for the rest of your life. Uh, and, also, and just so people know, like Lee did not write the headline for the cover. Yes. Okay? <laughs> yeah. So like, but, <laughs> and, and by the way, if you're going to come take shots at Lee in our open floor mail at gmail.com email, just don't. Okay. He's no. off limits. <laughs> Rob's off limits. I don't want to hear it. You know who wrote it is our 
editor in chief, Chris Stone, and um, <laughs> and I give him shit about it, but I al- I've also said like you should definitely be proud about that forever. Um, and the uh, oh yeah, so the, you, your Nets thing. I don't want to be a dick and come here after the fact saying that I was right, but. I will say that I experienced the inverse of of what you did with that Nets trade, where I had just started at Grantland when that trade went down, and I was super down on the Nets and like what they were going to be with that with those guys, and criticized the trade. But um, <clears throat> excuse me, but the but I was out in L.A. And it was my first weekend out there, and I criticized the trade on, like, a Friday. And then some asshole Nets fan (laughs) spent, like, the entire weekend tweeting at me about how I was dumb and how I was so wrong and all this stuff. And I really took the criticism to heart, and I was sitting in this empty apartment in Los Angeles. And I was like, man, like, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. And in the end, I was validated by real life uh but that was one where i took it was it was a rough weekend on the internet for me um and that but, commenter grew up to become ben simmons amazing <laughs> like exactly. full circle for full circle for both of you the only other there were a couple other things i mean i've gotten a lot of things wrong over the years kd to dc was it was a dream that that died pretty hard um and the KD Lakers. the role player. Come on. I mean, that's the most <laughs> embarrassing one. I, I don't know how you how you even get up for this podcast, honestly, after that. That was more tough. more recently, if, if anyone wants to go back and read a my Lakers article from like the second week of the season last year. <laughs> the that's baby Lakers funny. are back. <laughs> <laughs> um I picked Carl Anthony Towns to win defensive player of the year last year. Uh and he proceeded to be a turnstile on defense for the next like seven months but there were two big ones um first of all when i was at grantland i was going to i was a big Jameis winston fan and Uh, i uh (laughs) yeah so i had been i had written a couple things about him on the blog and i was going to florida state to interview him and like profile him basically for the following week and I it was a Friday and I was supposed to fly out and there was like a terrorist scare at LAX and they closed down the entire airport and I could not get out to get to Tallahassee for the FSU Miami game that Saturday night. And um, it's really good that I couldn't get there because I didn't write the piece. And had I gone down there, like I was all in on Jameis being like this, the, the next generational athlete and um and it, i would have written like a fawning piece about how charismatic he is how intelligent he is how great he is and then like four days later that whole, the rape scandal broke and so my my piece probably would have run about 12 hours before that tmz story broke um so that was one where i was saved in a basketball sense and to answer this question like in the magazine um I, one of my first profiles was writing about Boris Diaw like a year and a half ago. And that one, I had a lot of fun writing it, but I really thought that like we were going to hit Boris at the right time just as like the Spurs were on a collision course with the Warriors and Boris was going to be the most important player it, to like the Spurs' chances in that series. And then... It literally it ran with, with the Spurs up. I think either two two zero or two one, and they they had blown out OKC in game one. And then as soon as it ran, uh, the the Spurs just completely fell apart. Boris was like the twelfth man on the bench, and um, I found out later that he was like kind of on the outs with Pop at that point, and. So I, I sort of jinxed the Spurs generally and specifically Boris, um, but it was still a lot of fun to write that story, so I don't care. Yeah, remind me never to get coffee with you because career will just fall apart immediately <laughs> afterwards. Look, we had a great cup of coffee, man. That's all that really matters. Oh, boy. That's uh, that's rough. Yeah, and he got, tra- he got traded, and then now <laughs> yeah, he's out of the league. <laughs> He Holy got traded, cow. He got traded like a month later. I felt so bad, but you know, I've emailed with him and he's still he's 
he was appreciative. That's all that matters. Oh. Um, <laughs> no, he's he's taking his segue through Red Rocks with a drone to film himself. He's doing just fine. Boris is living <laughs> exactly. the life. Boris is living the ultimate Gulliver life, and that's <laughs> that's a win. Um, final question here from Anonymous. He says, I'm the secret electrician the ringer wrote about a few months back. John Gonzalez can confirm this. If Andrew has any balls at all, he'll ask at Media Day if they removed any of my pro hinky secret messages. So give us a little backstory, though. All right. So the backstory is honestly, normal. If you don't already know the backstory, you don't need to know the backstory. All I'll say is that I read this message and I knew exactly what he meant when he said, I'm the secret electrician. I know, I know the ringer article he was referring to. I know John Gonzalez and have talked to him about the Sixers. And I knew what pro hinky secret messages he had hidden around the building and connecting all of this in my head. My number one takeaway was like, I need to take a step back from the NBA internet generally and specifically Sixers internet because all this shit is just getting a little bit too real. Just wait until they find out what you did to Simmons, man. Your career is <laughs> going to be in a stop tough it. spot. Stop <laughs> it. People are going to be like, wow, did Andrew Sharp get into a, fight, a fist fight with Ben Simmons? Uh, just wait till no. they transcribe this portion for the, for the website. People are going <laughs> to have no context. They're going to be like, oh my God, I read that Sharp got into a fight. Holy cow. We're good. All right, it's time to wrap it. This is got. This is why we don't record at night. Um, we'll be back next week. At once, Ben gets back. He, Ben's going to Portland for the weekend, and he's going to come back, and we're going to record our fantasy basketball preview. If you have questions about fantasy basketball specifically, please send them. I can't wait to find out what fantasy basketball is. I can't wait to hear. Uh, all of your incorrect uh, recommendations for people. Uh, I don't really know how to prepare because usually I just say the opposite of whatever you say. So it might be on the fly thing where you're recommending one thing and I have to quickly figure out what the exact polar opposite of it is to recommend that on the Basketball Fantasy Podcast. But it will be a good time, a learning experience for everyone. Guys, five-star reviews. Try to be a superstar. Email us, openfloormail at gmail.com. Don't forget ben.golver on instagram i'm over a thousand followers andrew people love the outdoor photos even if you don't i'll talk to you next week all right man take it easy